Our scriptures this morning are from Luke and Philippians. Luke 4, 1 to 14. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. Philippians 2, verses 1 to 11. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking at your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the story of our faith. Now let's write our faith stories too. We thank you for opportunities to worship together in our various places, and we thank you for the love that binds us all to one another. And we ask that during these next few moments, the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, for you and you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So some believe it is only great power that can hold evil in check. 
But that is not what I have found. I have found that it is the small everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay, small acts of kindness and love. That comes from the wizard Gandalf. You know, I've learned throughout the years, and I was often reminded by a dear friend and mentor of mine, that scripture is the living word. It's organic. Each time that you read a passage, it's able to speak differently to you than it did the last time. That is, if you allow for that kind of movement of the spirit. This can be very surprising at times, especially when you read a familiar passage that you've meditated on, listened to sermons on, and have even preached on many times. Today is one of those surprising times. When I read the passages for today, this time, the words, words that jumped out to me probably, well, probably surprisingly, and for the very first time, were words that resembled that quote from the great theologian, Jimi Hendrix. When the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know, know peace. I am aware that others have said this long before Jimi Hendrix. He may have not come up with this originally, but no matter where the sentiment originally comes from, those are the words that spoke to me on these two passages. Let me see if I can explain. In the scripture from Luke, we read this morning, we see Jesus, led by the Spirit, heading off into the wilderness to prepare for his ministry. In the wilderness, he is tempted. He, and he withstood those temptations by quoting scripture and by staying true to the task that God had in store for him. We read this story from one of the Gospels every first Sunday of Lent, those seven weeks before Easter. This is a time when we often look at the things that tempt us and stand between us and our relationship with the Holy. This is a time when we prepare ourselves for the task that God has in store for us. It's really a powerful lesson and it's a powerful practice. And I've preached on this before and I am sure you have heard sermons on this before. But this year, as I read and thought about the passage, this living word, the larger context of this story, and the power of God's love became very apparent in my thinking. Perhaps this is because most of my preaching lately and my writing lately have centered on God's powerful, all-encompassing love for each of us, for all of us, for all of our community, for all of God's creation. And perhaps it's also because this story is taken in context is an illustration of that very same message of love. How do you say that, that this is an illustration of love? I'm glad you asked because I'm going to go ahead and try to explain it to you. You see in Luke, immediately before Jesus set out into the wilderness, if you disregard that section on his Ancestry.com results, immediately before this is the story of Jesus' baptism where after Jesus was baptized and was praying the Spirit landed on him in front of others and in the form of a dove and the voice was heard identifying him you Jesus you are my son the beloved I'm very pleased with you the beloved dearly loved dear to one's heart the Spirit identified and named Jesus as dearly loved, dear to God's own heart. That alone is a powerful message. Imagine that. It must have been a profound, had a profound effect on Jesus that day. His sense of identity, on, and it gave him the courage to face that journey ahead of him. We know what that's like. We know that when we are dearly loved, the world becomes a brighter place. The unknown becomes less scary. The temptations and the challenges in life are much more easily to easily faced. It was this very same spirit who filled Jesus and sustained Jesus and lifted him up in love. This very same spirit who led him into the unknown. It was that very same spirit who accompanied him on his journey as he stepped out in faith and into God's love. 
The temptations Jesus faced are similar to temptations that we face in life. Temptations of power and influence, of sustenance, of riches, and of safety. Who of us would not want to have a little fame, a little recognition, a little credit for all of our deeds? Who of us would not want to be guaranteed that we not only have everything that we need, but perhaps we even have everything that we could ever want? Who of us would not want to have power over our lives, or perhaps power over others? But Jesus carrying with him only his knowledge of God's love for him that was found in scripture and that profound, powerful message that came at his baptism, Jesus was able to withstand it all because Jesus knew that there was no power on earth that could stand when placed next to the power of God's love. Jesus was dearly loved, dear to God's own heart, and, the, and God had a powerful plan for him to teach all the children of the world as he knew it, that they were beloved as well, to teach all of these beloved children to love others in return. And in teaching this in his world, he teaches us here today. When the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. That love of power is a tricky little devil. It's very human to be tempted by it. We see it in all the aspects of life. Society tells us it's important to be first. It's important to be right. It's important to be wealthy. It's important to have fame. It's important to be known and to have influence. It's important to be a leader. Heck, it's even important to just be important. I could probably give you good examples in everyday life to speak to this. Things that I do, things that you might do, things that others do, things we all do. But I won't. I'll let you come up with your own examples. What I will give you is this. That kind of power does not lead to contentment. It doesn't lead to peace. Not at all. Abd al-Rahman, who is famed for being one of the important figures in the establishment of Islam in the 8th century, was quoted in saying this, I have now reigned above 50 years in victory or peace, beloved by my subjects, dreaded by my enemies, respected by my allies, riches and honors, power and pleasure, have waited, awaited my call, nor does any earthly blessing seem to have been wanting. I have diligently numbered the days of pure, genuine happiness that have fallen my lot. They amount to 14. That kind of power, the quest to be known, to be revered, to be in control and to have it all and want for naught, leads not to love, but to greed and dissatisfaction to conceit and bigotry, to disparity between the very rich and the very poor, to jealousy and hatred, to self-preservation and disregard for the humanity of others. And the love of power will never accomplish God's dream for humanity. It will never lead the world to peace, the peace that God is wait wanting for us, to fill us, to sustain us, to light us up and to heal the world. We're stepping now into the season of Lent and this is a time that we often look for the, look at the things that tempt us and stand between us and our relationship with the Holy. This is a time we prepare ourselves for the task that God has in store for us and it really is a powerful lesson and a powerful practice. And you may have a practice of giving up a temptation or obsession for Lent. If so, that's absolutely wonderful. It's a wonderful way of attempting to have that same mind of Jesus that the Apostle Paul talked about. But I want to add to this practice so that you're not just simply fasting from your struggles, but you're taking on new practices to fill in those spaces. And these are words from Pope Francis. He says, do you want to fast this Lent? Fast from hurting words and say kind words. Fast from sadness and be filled with gratitude. Fast from anger and be filled with patience. Fast from pessimism and be filled with hope. Fast from worries and trust in God. Fast from complaints and contemplate simplicity. 
Fast from pressures and be prayerful. Fast from bitterness and fill your heart with joy. Fast from selfishness and be compassionate to others. Fast from grudges and be reconciled. Fast from words and be silent so that you can listen. Fast from the love of power and step into the power of God's love. Now come for full circle and I need to wrap this up so I want to repeat a quote that I began with. These are the words from J.R.R. Tolkien that were spoken by the wizard Gandalf. Some believe it is only great power that can hold evil in check, but that is not what I have found. I found that it is small everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay, small acts of kindness and love. Or, as that great theologian Jimi Hendrix said so profoundly, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. As you travel through the season of Lent, may you have that same mind as Jesus. May you resist the temptations that stand in between you and God. May you know that you are beloved, and may you share that love with those around you. Most of all, may you know peace. Amen.